In result, this judgment confirms the judgments of the Quebec Superior Court, at first instance, and of the Quebec Court of Appeal, both of which have dismissed the parents' claim. It should be added, however, that the Court of Appeal refused to hear the claim on its merits. An analysis of the reasons, however, leads us to a number of important conclusions. We are in agreement with the law as stated by the Supreme Court of Canada, in that it says that proof of a violation of freedom of religion involves a two-pronged test. One, one has to establish a religious belief or practice, and two, one must prove a violation of that belief or practice. The Supreme Court of Canada concluded that the appellants successfully met the first prong of the test. Indeed, the Supreme Court concluded that they had made the demonstration that as Roman Catholic parents, they have an obligation to raise their children according to Roman Catholic faith and morals. It should be added that this first prong of the test is to be analyzed on the basis of the criteria of sincere belief. So it's on the second prong of the test that the appellants failed, according to the Supreme Court of Canada. The reasons for this conclusion should be looked at very carefully. At trial, the Superior Court had based its conclusion, in very large part, on an expert report from a theologian filed by the Quebec Attorney General. The trial judge's reasoning is criticized and formally repudiated by Mr. Justice Lavelle of the Supreme Court of Canada. As to Madam Justice Deschamps, she does not expressly deal with this question, but nowhere in her reasons does she attempt to ground her judgment on the expert report of the theologian. It is also worthy of note that the Attorney General, in his factum, his written submissions in the Supreme Court of Canada, was no longer relying on this expert report himself, which had, paradoxically, been the basis on which he had won a trial. Thus, despite the fact that the judgment of the Superior Court is confirmed in its result, it is repudiated in terms of the legal basis on which it was made. So, if the appellants were successful in convincing the Supreme Court of Canada that the reasoning of the Superior Court was wrong, why did they fail, nonetheless? According to the judgment rendered by the Supreme Court today, the problem is strictly one of the insufficiency of the evidentiary record before the Court. Justice Lavelle summed up their position very accurately in indicating that, according to the parents, the program conveys the idea that religious values do not constitute a sound basis for making ethical decisions, it presents a relativistic view of religion, and places children in a moral vacuum. This is the most disappointing aspect of the judgment for the appellants. Their disappointment is based on the fact that in Mrs. S. L.'s own testimony, she had presented very compelling points expressing her concerns on precisely those issues. Moreover, the appellants had presented expert evidence laying out their concerns. And indeed, before the Supreme Court, certain very troubling aspects of the ERC program were spelled out, notably the following. Number one, with respect to its religious culture component, the program does not consist of a presentation of world religions. It is not a world religions course at all. Rather, it adopts an approach which necessarily trivializes and discredits religion in the eyes of the people, enforcing the teacher to present religious content always in juxtaposition with mythical and supernatural themes. That's a formal requirement in the program. In the course textbooks, of which unfortunately only one was in the evidentiary record in court, that often leads to presentations of religious figures alongside cartoon characters, for example. 
on the part of the designers of the program, this is not a banal decision, and nor is it one that fosters the neutrality of the program. Instead, it's a choice, the inevitable consequence of which is to discourage religious belief and practice of any kind, which the state is prohibited from doing, as Justice LaBelle himself, himself says in his reasons in today's judgment. Moreover, it is important to dissipate the misconception that ethics and religious culture is a world verdict in scores. It isn't. It actually formally prohibits a linear and sequential presentation of world religion. It's also a program which is given from grade one in primary school right up to the end of, of high school with only one year secondary three in which it's not given. And it's a program whose specific objectives are not to impart knowledge, but rather to cultivate a world. Thus, the appellant's position was very simple. According to them, they are in no way opposed to a course which teaches, which would teach their children world religions and impart knowledge about world religions. Quite the contrary. But ethics and religious culture doesn't do that. Instead, it's a form of indoctrination because its pedagogical methods and content tend to trivialize all religious faiths, not just those of that of the adults, and to promote an approach to ethics which discards reference to religiously based moral program. <coughs> a further thing should be noticed. In all of the levels in which this file has gone through, from Superior Court to Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court, not one judge has analyzed much in, or even summed up the extra report of Professor Guy Durand of the University of Montreal, which was filed by the appellant. And yet, this extra report makes a very compelling demonstration of all of the various troubling elements which I have just mentioned, and others still. It is therefore disappointing to see that the Supreme Court of Canada concluded that there was an insufficient evidentiary record in this case. Madam Justice Deschamps and the judges who concurred in her reasons came at the problem as if the appellants were simply against having their children exposed to other religions. With respect, the position of the appellants cannot be reduced to that proposition. As to Justices Lebel and Fish, they adopt a more nuanced approach. Although they conclude that the appellants did not discharge the, the burden of evidence they had, they make a number of important points. At the end of their analysis, they conclude that they are not at all ready to discard an assessment of the ERC program according to which it would effectively, it would indeed be an unconstitutional intrusion by the state into freedom of religion contrary to the principles of a secular state. They conclude by insisting on the fact that in the future it cannot at all be ruled out that the program could indeed violate fundamental human rights. In short, the appellants, who sought an exemption from the program even before it came into effect, were faced with a number of very difficult evidentiary obstacles in preparing their case, given that the program at that point had absolutely no track record which could be looked to. They lost because, according to the rules of evidence, they are the ones who have the burden. But the government, for its part, also failed. Indeed, one should be very careful to avoid concluding that today's judgment in any way validates the constitutionality of the program. Judges Lebel and Fish say so expressly and openly express their doubts and apprehensions about the program. And as for the government's 
expert reports by a philosopher and a theologian, which have been presented in support of the alleged neutrality of the program, nowhere is this evidence analyzed. In conclusion then, despite the very disappointing result for the parents, the case nevertheless remains a tie. No one having successfully convinced the court of its thesis, and the whole case having turned on the burden of proof. Therefore, Quebecers need to remain vigilant because it is not excluded that a future contestation could be successful.